one of the key instincts we have is to favor the in-group over the out-group. Yes. Right? Like once you've defined the in-group in a particular way, and that's very flexible, that uh, is very malleable, depends from one historical context to another. But once you've said, this is my in-group, you have a strong instinct to favor the in-group over the out-group, to treat the people who are part of us with right. sometimes great courage and altruism, but to treat the people who are them uh, with disregard and sometimes rank cruelty and violence. Hmm. And one of the big things that social norms and ideals need to do is to both encourage us to lean into more socially productive identities and to check ourselves, to not give us a reason, an ideology that uh, encourages us to have this deep disregard for other groups. And I think we're failing on both of those things. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer. I'm Frank Schaefer, and you are listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer and or watching it. This goes out live on Facebook first, and then to YouTube and to all sorts of other channels where um, these sorts of things happen. And I guess it is a podcast, even though we do video too. If you like this or are interested, please like it in the online sense and tell people about it and share it. Uh, my guest today is Yasha Monk, and Yasha is a writer and academic host of the Good Fight podcast, and most recently author of The Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time. Uh, and Yasha, it's a real pleasure to have you on. I, I, I bought the book on Kindle. And I've read the whole thing. I have copious notes. I'm occasionally going to go to them and be uh, reading from the book. I just first want to mention that um, I thought the Kirkus review was really good. And they uh, talked about the identity trap like this. They said, hardcore proponents and detractors alike may not be won over, but there is a vast middle that can be reached through open debate and plain common sense. This book is a solid launching point for further constructive debate. And that very much, I think, is an accurate assessment of the book and, and mirrors my own view uh, of the importance of the book. And I, I would just say one other thing. You have written a number of books that are very tough on the rise of the right wing in America, the Trump years, the religious right. You come from a a Marxist, actually a communist background uh, of the left. We'll get into that a little bit. And so I think people need to know that because this is a book that uh, some folks on the what I'll call the new, new left, not to be con confused with the new left of the 60s and 70s when I was um, younger, uh, but this, this kind of um, identity trap left that you describe um, in the New York Times, the, that person wrote from that point of view, didn't like it much. In The Guardian, the, the, the Washington Post gave the book a terrific review uh, that I thought was fair, having read the book. So welcome, and let's let's dive in. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, let's get a little on the personal side. Tell me about yourself. You talk about your parents in the book and your background. So let's start there, and then we'll get into the content of the book. Talk to me about your family and, and who you are where you come from, how you were raised a little bit, and then we'll get into the content of this book. Amazing. Well, thank, first, thanks for having me on. I really look forward to, to, to this chat. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, you said I've come from a, from, a, from a communist background, but certainly true in terms of my family story. Um, my grandparents uh, were raised in shtetls in uh, what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, what today is uh, Ukraine. Um, and as teenagers, they became communists because they felt that that would help the world overcome the prejudices that had structured it for mm. a very long time. Um, uh, they survived the Holocaust by going east to the Soviet Union, and they helped to build up a communist regime in Poland after the war. But it turned out that things are a little bit more complicated, and that regime ended up uh, uh, turning on its Jews in an extreme way. There was about 50,000 Jews left in the country in 1967. Uh, when the communist government uh, initiated this kind of you know, state-sponsored pogrom. And by 1970, there was about 500 people left in the country. And my uh, uh, grandparents and my parents, who were you know, about 20 years old, left uh, Poland. Uh, uh, and my mom ended up in Germany. And so I uh, grew up in, in Germany, um, went to school there, uh, and then came to uh, university in England and finally to grad school in the United States and have been living in America 
for uh, you know coming on to the last 20 years. I think it's been about, mm. uh, depending on how I count, 18 or 16 years that I've been in the United States. Yeah, you and I actually share something interesting in terms of background, and that is that we both came from backgrounds that had a sense of mission. Mine in the literal sense that my parents were American missionaries where I was born in Switzerland, and I'm mm. 71, I was born in the 1950s, um, and I left that background, much as you have left something of your Marxist background, and now you are a liberal progressive, I guess would be the way to describe you. But Does that mean I've been I've been eyeing this uh, book cover that I can see behind you? Is that actually I had a discussion with Ernie about? Yeah, this is a, a memoir of mine I wrote a few years ago that after Terry Gross interviewed me for a long time became a bestseller, and this is a long time ago. And I said to Ernie, maybe I should just take this down. I've been putting it up during some of my own comments, but I said, you know, actually it relates to what I'm saying because Yasha and I share something, and that is we have both traveled from very deliberate chosen backgrounds by our parents, and we've moved to a, a different place. The other reason is that I think one of the reasons I really love your book and would recommend it to everybody is that I, having come from a fundamentalist right-wing religious right background, where we were instrumental in helping getting, uh, for instance, Ronald Reagan elected, and we know that we knew uh, that we know the Bush family, I have handwritten notes from Barbara, for instance, and so forth and so on. Um, I moved away from that background and and am considered by those folks as a heretic now. Mm. And I and I have a good nose for fundamentalism and the judgmental kind of exclusivity of that. And, and in a way, therefore, I sort of tap in to a lot of the argument in your book in the sense that the the identity trap and what you described there, um, just to, to introduce a little bit from the book itself, um, is is something that I find very relevant to my own background and and my own sensitivities to uh, that kind of exclusivist fundamentalist view of things, which in a way is 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 what you're talking about, not from the right, but from this kind of new left that has left aside the idea of universalist aspirations and instead has moved to a place where everybody is identified by race or gender and so forth. So I want to read something it's from interesting. your book. So if I, if I can just comment on that for a second, it's interesting, but I think you're not alone in that. So I don't come from a religious background. My family is Jewish. I am not religious myself. My parents weren't religious. My grandparents weren't religious because they became communists, right? right. Um, uh, but I have a number of friends in the United States who grew up in very religious and sometimes evangelical, sometimes fundamentalist uh, uh, families. And yeah. they... Uh, ended up often, you know, in their youth, being very drawn to it, working as youth pastors and all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, but but in the end, uh, falling out of that faith because they have a little bit of a contrarian streak because they didn't like the fact that you couldn't ask questions. Yes. That it was this kind of pull of orthodoxy. You better get with a program, or we're going to exactly. think that you have morally gone astray and judge you. And they gravitated towards liberal and progressive. Uh, milieus, right? They moved to New York and other big cities and hmm. uh, worked in left-leaning organizations. And over the last 10 years, some of them have started to say, hang on a second, suddenly I feel the same pull of orthodoxy. I feel the same um, you know, litany of orthodox statements that I'm supposed to recite without thinking about them too hard. And if I ask questions that are inconvenient, people think I've gone morally wrong and I'm sort hmm. of expelled from the community. And they, they sort of find themselves uh, uh, in a somewhat similar, even though the beliefs are very different, and structurally somewhat similar situation to one they escaped in their church. So I always find that parallel to be mm. quite interesting. It's not an exact parallel, I don't think, but there is yeah. an element of it that, that, that you're not the only one to point out. Well, the kind of groupthink aspect is very similar. And I want to read something from your book. I've gone through and grabbed some quotes and not in uh, always in the order in which you wrote them, but they sort of hang together. To build a more just world society should strive to live up to their universalist aspirations instead of abandoning them. Advocates of identity synthesis, your term, um, identity synthesis to replace the idea of woke and so forth. It's a better usage and you, you've you introduced this, so that's a good thing. Advocates of identity synthesis have long thought of philosophical liberals as their main adversaries. I thought that was very interesting. To evaluate the identity synthesis and its attack on liberalism, it makes sense to boil this tradition down to its main claims. Such a rational 
reconstruction would focus on three propositions. First, the key to understanding the world is to examine it through the prism of group identities like race, gender, and sexual orientation. Second, supposedly universal values and neutral rules merely serve to obscure ways in which privileged groups dominate those that are marginalized. And third, to build a just world, we must adopt norms and laws that explicitly make the way the state treats each citizen and how citizens treat each other depend on identity on the identity group uh, to which they belong. And I think in, in a way that doesn't sum your book up, but it certainly proposes what you're dealing with. Um, so if you want to elaborate a little on that, and then I have a lot of other stuff from the book I want to talk to you about, uh, but why don't we start there? Yeah, so I think what, what has happened over the last decade or so is that uh, we've seen the rise of a new uh, set of ideas about race, gender, and sexual orientation, a novel ideology that some people call woke, I don't particularly like the term, but that is effectively what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, what's important to understand about these ideas is that they go well beyond other forms of what you might call identity politics. Mm. So, you know, in some sense, people like Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King Jr. engaged in identity politics. They were organizing the African-American community to fight against injustice. And I have no bone to pick with them. I think they are the best of what... America's political tradition has on offer. Mm. Um, but there is a, a, a new set of ideas which uh, both tries to communicate to people that what ultimately defines them is the group into which we're born. It's not just a social reality that we should recognize and along whose lines we might sometimes organize. It is the thing that effectively makes you, you. And if you stand at a different intersection of identities to me, then we might not even be fully able to understand each other. That's a very different set of ideas. And secondly, it is an ideology that uh, rejects the possibility that we might be able to make progress, as people like Frederick Douglass and MLK believed, um, by invoking the promises of a constitution, the universal values and norms and rules to which we've aspired in American history and saying, by what right are you excluding me from them? Mm. Uh, if uh, I am discriminated against, you are violating the principles you claim to stand for. And so perhaps we have to bring reality into closer alignment with those ideals. No, they say, we haven't made any progress. Derek Bell, the founder of critical race theory, claimed that in the year 2000, America was as racist as it had been in 1950 or 1850. Something mm. that I think is offensive, not to the great Americans living today, but to the Americans who suffered much worse forms of injustice in yeah. the past. And because he was not able to believe that we've made any progress, it is unsurprising but he came to the conclusion that we should rip up our institutions and start from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he ended up saying that we should reject, quote unquote, the defunct racial equality ideology of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you summarized very well what I suggest are the three main claims of this ideology. Namely, mm -hmm. firstly, that what truly defines you is your identity group into which you're born, um, that uh, the way to understand the world is to look at it through the prism of race and gender and sexual orientation, that that is the key to understanding and making sense of the world. Secondly, that uh, values like uh, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, like civil rights era legislation, like the 14th Amendment uh, mm. passed after the Civil War, uh, they are all just meant to pull the wool over your eyes. They're just meant to hide and perpetuate forms of racial and sexual mm. and other discrimination. And finally, therefore, to do better, we should make how we treat each other and how the state treats all of us explicitly depend on the kind of groups into which we're born. And I mm. think that there is a coherent set of responses to these, a set of responses that take seriously uh, racial and other forms of injustice, uh, but is better able to point towards a appealing future and towards a realistic path of how to accomplish that future. Mm. And that's to yeah. say that, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Well, and that's to say that first, uh, yes, race and gender and sexual orientation matter, mm. of course, but so do other things for understanding the world. So does social class, so does religion, so does uh, patriotism, so do individual attributes and aspirations and actions. Mm. Uh, secondly, that uh, actually, those universal values are a lot of what has allowed us to make progress in history. Uh, mm. The gay rights movement succeeded 
when people said, how is my life different than yours? By what right are you excluding me from an institution like marriage that is of such benefit to you? Um, Frederick Douglass recognized that free speech allowed many people in his day to say terrible and terribly racist things. But he called free speech the dread of tyrants because he recognized how important it was for a tool, as a tool for people who were uh, 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 marginal, who uh, were not powerful, who were deeply unpopular, who were trying to fight for causes like the liberation from slavery. And that finally, therefore, the third answer is, no, let's not rip up those institutions. Let's be aware of the imperfections of our society, but let's try to bring it into closer alignment with our ideals. Let's try to live up to them rather than to rip them up. Martin Luther King recognized that uh, uh, the Bank of Justice had issued a fraudulent promissory note to African-Americans, but he demanded that the Bank of Justice honor the promissory note. He did not instruct his followers to rip up the promissory note. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the themes that comes through as you talk about this idea of intersectionality, um, and I want you to explain that a little bit, because in a weird way, you had a very prophetic paragraph in your book that leapt out at me having read it right after um, the Hamas attack on the kibbutzim there in southern Israel, and then the entire conflagration that's unfolding. And I just want to read this, and then I want you to go back and talk about the intersectional analysis and what it means. Um, this intersectional analysis of the structure of injustice easily lends itself to an intersectional intersectional account of the political action that is needed to make the world a better place. To be intersectional, according to this reading, was to recognize that anybody who is truly committed to the eradication of one form of injustice, like gender discrimination, must also be committed to the eradication of other forms of injustice, like racial or religious discrimination. As the language of intersectionality became popular in activist circles, this tempted some activists to place a very high entry barrier on anybody who wants to participate in a political movement. If somebody wants to join a feminist movement committed to intersectionality, these activists now also expect that person to agree with a set of specific proposition, positions about such varied topics as the nature of race discrimination, the injustice suffered by disabled people, and the conflict in Palestine. And um, obviously, in the context of the fact that I've been watching video clips of students on various campuses ripping down the pictures of babies murdered in their cribs because they're part of this intersectional movement. And then you look, who's this student? And it's someone saying, well, you know, I have problems with being a young American, uh, you know, that's, that's a brown person or a gay activist or whatever. And suddenly that is translated to them to um, political activity um, of the kind that a lot of people find rather abhorrent, not even addressing the context of, of anti-Semitism or anything like that, just uh, the, the raw kind of reaction. In, in a really weird way, a horrible way, a way that you wouldn't wish for, uh, what's been going on in terms of intersectional activity. Um, someone said, I think, on uh, perhaps it was in the Times or the Post or the Guardian or somewhere that Maybe the reaction from this community of people taking this intersectional idea that I want you to explain in a moment um, to the extreme they have in apparently not being able to have any sympathy for the victims of the Hamas attack in view of their intersectional connection, two things jumped out. One, the comment was that maybe this is like the Manson murders that a lot of people say sort of ended the idealism of the 60s. So, so maybe your argument has been fast forwarded. We'll get to that in a minute. But the other one was this sort of comment that was facetious on one of the late night talk shows, and I don't want it to be offensive, but they were saying that, um, you know, for some groups, um, such as Black Lives Matter, to come out in favor of the Palestinians, or um, especially gay and trans groups, to come out in favor of that, would be something like Black Lives Matter coming out in favor of the Ku Klux Klan and having sympathy with them based on the fact that you know ISIS takes gay people, ties their hands behind their back, beats the shit out of them and throws them off buildings. So does Hamas. Uh, and, and there's a disconnect here that is just mind blowing. 
without going off the subject of your book, it just seems to me that your book suddenly becomes 50 times more relevant given our situation and how they, the people you're talking about have really dropped the ball on a very basic gut level reaction of horror to what's happened. And I'm not addressing this because you happen to be Jewish or you know anything to do with that. I'm just amazed that the relevance of your book just went up by like 500%. No, I, I, I share your judgment, and it does that in, in two ways. Um, first of all, it helps to understand why, uh, you know, the Democratic Socialists for America ended up uh, calling for protests in which Hamas was being glorified, why the Chicago chapter of Black Lives Matter um, uh, issued an invitation to a protest in which they were glorifying the paragliders who landed in a music festival in southern Israel and murdered over 250 people, innocent civilians from all over the world, by the way, who were just participating in this music festival. It explains why all of these different student activist groups at Harvard banded together to uh, 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 defend the actions of Hamas, saying that it was fully Israel's moral responsibility that Hamas initiated this contact and killed over 1,400 mm -hmm. people, taking 200 hostages in the process, yeah. babies and grandmothers and, and so on. And as you're saying, it does connect to the idea of intersectionality, uh, which originated as a, I think, helpful academic point by Kimberly Crenshaw, simply saying that the kind of uh, discrimination that a Black woman, for example, might experience goes above and beyond the arithmetic sum of the experienced uh, uh, of the discrimination experienced by white women on the one side or black men on the other side, that I think is true and it's a helpful thing to point out. Uh, but then this idea of intersectionality came to be broadened to saying that if you stand at one intersection of identities and I stand at another intersection of identities, I don't really understand you. Yeah. But because all forms of oppression are somehow linked, the only way to be an activist in good standing is to fight against all forms of oppression at the same time. And mm. since I don't understand you, the only way to fight against all forms of oppression at the same time is to defer to you and your interpretation of what the right way is of fighting for your political cause. And so mm. suddenly, if you're a campus activist who cares about feminism, or you're a campus activist who cares about the environment, or you're a campus activist who cares about one of 17 other causes, you need to sign up with a particular set of views that uh, far left activists have taken on about the nature of the Palestine uh, Israel conflict. Mm. Um, the second question then is, well, what is the nature of those views? Why is it that even when an event is as dark as uh, Hamas initiating uh, this conflict, um, uh, uh, going around murdering these civilians in horrific ways, in one case, um, uh, uh, broadcasting from one of the victims' Facebook accounts mm. as they murdered and slaughtered uh, why is it that that looks like uh, they are not at fault? Uh, why are people unwilling to condemn that as terrorism? Why are some people defending it? Um, mm. And that, I think, has to do with the simplistic moral categories that this ideology has taken on. It starts with the notion of structural racism, which is a helpful concept to understand some aspects of our society. The fact, for example, that, uh, you know, there's a slightly old fashioned example that used to be given. Um, you know, if somebody uh, wants to get a cab, nowadays they might order an Uber. Um, but if they want to hail a cab at the side of a road and they're Black, then some cab drivers who might not have individual prejudice against Black people, who might be Black themselves, might not pick up a Black passenger because they're worried that the fare is going to lead them to a neighborhood where they're less likely to find passengers, mm -hmm. right? But might be less, uh, more socioeconomically deprived, right? That's a form of structural racism, structural barriers that people experience that don't necessarily hinge on uh, sort of straightforward old-fashioned racism, which consists in saying members of this group are somehow inferior, right? It doesn't have to entail that belief. The mm. problem comes when you jettison the old-fashioned view of racism and think that all racism has to be structural, such that mm. it becomes impossible for a member of a marginalized group to be racist towards a member of a dominant group, as many people now argue. Then you suddenly make it impossible to explain what happens when a member of an ethnic minority kills somebody who's Jewish because of anti-Semitic reasons, as has happened in the United States in the last years, for example, right? Mm -hmm. In the same way, if you uh, 
simplistically say that uh, Jews are white uh, colonizers and settlers, and Palestinians are people of color um, who uh, have been marginalized. That is far too simple a reading of that yeah. situation. It doesn't take into account the fact that most Jews in Israel at this point are Mizrahi Jews who have been expelled from Middle Eastern countries since 1945 with nowhere to turn than Israel. They are no more settlers than Palestinians are settlers. Um, the fact that uh, they're not actually uh, noticeably ethnically different from Palestinians. It's not yeah. that easy to tell who is a Mizrahi Jew and who is a Palestinian. The idea that one of them is a white person who uh, profits from all of white supremacy and the other person is a person of color who therefore uh, is incapable of doing anything wrong is hugely oversimplistic. So, so I think um, both the sort of instincts and actions of the activist groups, but also the deeper um, insistence that this is a a uh, very uh, Manichaean conflict where there's the, you know, uh, bad, white, dominant settler side and the good, virtuous, non-white victim side um, uh, hails from this uh, novel ideology that I, that I describe and dissect and criticize in, in The Identity Trap in my new book. And just to reintroduce, um, this is, I'm Frank Schaefer, you're watching or listening to my podcast in conversation with Frank Schaefer, and my guest today is Yasha Monk, and Yasha is a writer and an academic. He's host of the Good Fight podcast. He's the author, most recently, of The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. One of the things that you address in your book very effectively, I think, is this idea of cultural appropriation set up against the idea of a multicultural diversity, which used to be a liberal ideal, where we can borrow from each other's cultures. And of course, you know, I read a lot of history for fun and profit. And one of the interesting things to me, for instance, is in visiting a place like Venice, understanding that when you ooh and ah over St. Mark's Palace, you're basically looking at stolen Byzantine artifacts from a crusade where the Genoese and the Venetians went down there and sacked Constantinople on their way to reclaim Jerusalem for Jesus. Um, and, and, and then... If you look at Venice um, as it is today, it is the work of all sorts of imperial overreach for centuries by the Venetians, who then themselves became the victims when the Austrians took over that part of the world, then the Germans, and so forth. Um, I like the fact that when it comes to the cultural appropriation, you come back and you argue for cultural assimilation. And I think we see some absurd examples of the idea of appropriation to the point where um, you have actors being 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 dismissed because they play a role. It's called acting that is outside of their actual, you know, gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity. Writers being parsed by sensitivity readers. Um, a friend of mine um, who, who's an author, and I'm a, I'm a novelist and an author myself. Uh, and I know other people who write books and all of a sudden they're getting notes back from their editor saying our sensitivity reader, you know, doesn't feel that you're writing um, in, in, you know, this this woman's role in your novel is appropriate given that you're a male. And of course, at that moment, all art evaporates because art is always human imagination and if you have to be the actual thing, it's it's a kind of a literalism that I haven't seen since my mother was telling me that the book of Genesis actually happened and the world was created in seven days and pay no attention to those scientists who say differently, this is our truth. A kind of a preparation for understanding why white evangelicals went for Donald Trump. <clears throat> They'd been raised from their mother's knee to reject the world as fake news on all scientific categories, whether it's climate change or the book of Genesis or biology or, or evolution, very well prepared for someone who came along uh, and told them they'd been right all along and that all of this was fake. And now you have people who call themselves progressives and liberals who are hiring sensitivity readers to make sure that somebody like me can no longer write a novel like my first novel, Portofino, which is translated in nine languages and well-loved uh, across the world in, in many cultures, because one of the characters, it's written from the point of view of a little boy, sort of in my voice when I was 11, 
having a crush on a little English girl, and I've got her in the dialogue, and lots of English women have told me that I've written a very good woman's role and a very good English voice, maybe something to do with the fact I went to British boarding schools. What happens to the next generation of writers who now have to limit their imagination to a literalistic racial gender or sexual orientation interpretation of who they are, and they're not allowed to range beyond that, whether they're an actor or a writer or someone else. I mean, at that moment, art as we understand it and, and communication ends. And so that's an area that impacts my life because I try to have my agent sell the next book. Do I really have to sit here and think that I can't write anything imaginative I haven't experienced? I haven't been to other planets, so I can't write Dune, for instance, um, because it's cultural appropriation of a cosmos that I haven't actually visited. That sort of literalism boggles me, and I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and you know, one thing that I always try to bring out when I talk about this book is that my complaint is not that, you know, here's these young people who have radical ideas, and they're just going a little bit too far in the right direction, you know. Mm. Um, I have sympathy for that. I was young once, and I had silly ideas that perhaps went a little bit too far in the right direction. And, uh, you know, I, I think what's going on here is that we're going in the wrong direction in many ways, right? Yeah. A world in which we're deeply worried and concerned about mutual cultural influence. Uh, is not going too far in the right direction, uh, mm. being too radical in pursuit of uh, justice. It is going in the wrong direction. It is impeding the kind of world that I want to live in, that is going to inspire the kind of solidarity that allows us to create more tolerant and thriving societies. I'm in mm. New York City right now as we record this conversation, and you know the million ways in which the city is shaped by people from all over the world, but in which those people also influence each other and co-create and build something new. That is what we should be proud of in a place mm -hmm. like New York, not something that we should be afraid of mm -hmm. in this city or in this country. Um, uh, and by the way, I just interrupt you there. That idea of being afraid of that is exactly what Tucker Carlson calls about when he talks about this replacement theory. It sort of flips it. But it's the same damn thing. That, that's what strikes me about this. When I was growing up in Europe in societies where we're experiencing significant levels of migration for the first time in a long while, at least, uh, you know, the idea that we have to bear, you know, we have to protect the purity of a culture and we mustn't allow people to influence and change it. And that was a right wing idea. That was an Afro nationalist right wing idea. And yeah. now we've sort of adopted it on the left. And the fact that we want to create sort of protect five hermetically sealed cultures with in our country, rather than one nation state sized culture, doesn't yeah. make it progressive. It just, you know, makes it equally misguided. Um, and, and you know, I worry like you about literature, uh, about, about the sensitivity readers. Um, Ian McEwen just gave a very nice interview about this, uh, uh, pointing out that if your job as a sensitivity reader is to warn about offensive material, you will find material that is offensive sure. because that's what your job depends on. Um, uh, uh, but I want to say something broader here, which is that, um, you know, I, we really should dismiss the entire idea of cultural appropriation. It has a superficial plausibility, a superficial appeal, because the term sometimes is applied to situations that were really unjust. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is true that in the 1950s and 1960s, some white musicians uh, were inspired by, sometimes stole the music of black musicians who weren't able to have big careers. But what was the injustice? The fact that there was white jazz saxophonists or the fact that those black musicians weren't able to travel across the American South, weren't allowed to perform in many concert venues, wouldn't be played on mainstream radio stations, wouldn't be or signed- Or stay in the hotel they were performing in. Exactly. That is the injustice, right? And so if we want to understand how to remedy that situation, we need to have much clearer language. The justice in the 50s and 60s would not have consisted in and did not consist in stopping the white jazz musician from playing. It mm. was empowering the black musicians to have the careers that they deserve, to stay at the damn hotel, to be able to play that concert venue, right? Yes. And then um, it's not just that we misidentify what philosophers call the wrong-making feature of these situations. It's that we're foregoing something that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every aspect of our culture, the language we're using right now, the technology we're using to connect, the way we write, the way we do math, 
all of that is a product of many different cultures around the world. Mm. Um, and we are impeding the future richness of our own culture mm. if we come to have this fear about mutual cultural influence. And by the way, we're making it harder to create the kind of connection with each other that can lead to empathy and solidarity and that makes sure that Pied Pipers like Tucker Carlson don't win out in the end. You know, the literary yeah. story that, that, that I share comes from somebody who I had the luck to meet, who's the grandfather of a mm. friend of mine um, and who uh, was one of the writers of Fiddler on the Roof. And he tells the lovely story. Uh, J Joseph Stein was his name. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago. Um, uh, and he tells the lovely story of when uh, uh, the Fiddler on the Roof was for the first time performed uh, outside of uh, an English-speaking country. And it happened to be in Japan. And he went over there for the last rehearsals. Um, and the producer of a Japanese production took him aside and said, you know, I have a question. Um, uh, you know, in America, do they understand this show? Do they relate to this show? And Joe was confused by this. He said, what are you talking about? Uh, we, we wrote it for an American audience. We're Americans, you know, like, of course, it's, it's meant for an American audience. And mm -hmm. the Japanese producer said, oh, but it's so Japanese. Yeah. Um, and so that ability of art to bring out universal themes that connect us to each other, mm -hmm. right? That see, that make us see our shared humanity. That's the recipe to a better world, not something we should be scared of. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I have another podcast I'm part of called Love in Common that my producer Ernie and I are part of where he is in a gay marriage, has been married to Rock or together with him, I think 17 or 18 years. And I've been with Jeannie for 53 and I'm 71 and he's much younger. And, you know, we we have- so You a, got married when you were 18? You're gonna have to tell me about your-, your Yes, and we're, and we're still somehow. together. We are still together, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I've written about that and so on. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we, what Ernie and I share, um, and what we talk about often is the commonality of our experiences. And if either of us were coming to this with an idea of you know, our identity as either white or gay or straight was kind of precluding those discussions, you know, that podcast would not happen, nor would any of my other conversations uh, be going on. And it just it strikes me that the kind of paranoia on the left when it comes to this kind of ideology, you have a, par a, a paragraph in your book that reads far right ideologies are so dangerous because they discourage people from widening their circle of sympathy in this manner, placing specific ethnic or cultural identities on a pedestal. They encourage their followers to value their group over the rights of outsiders or the claims of un universal human solidarity. That is exactly what Donald Trump's right wing rejects is the idea of universal human solidarity. And now we have what you're talking about coming from the supposed left. And in the same way that I tell some of the people who listen to me who know what my evangelical background was and that my father was a very famous evangelical thinker that it isn't that evangelicals follow Trump. It's that evangelicals who follow Trump are no longer evangelicals. They are part of a Trump cult. Similarly, I have a question for you. And that is, is the American left even the left any longer? Because I came out of the 1960s. Um, you know, we, we, we came from an environment where the idea of free speech was sacrosanct. The idea of a sensitivity reader would have been not just laughable, but we would have seen that as a right-wing Orwellian ploy to control what we were saying. You make a tremendous case for free speech in your book, calling, for instance, on the Europeans who don't have the same constitution that we do to, to stop trying to make uh, laws about speech, particularly in the UK and so forth. So you want to talk a little bit about free speech, what's happening to it? Do you want to talk a little bit about the similarity between the right and today's left? And then lastly, and my old brain can't keep up with the ideas here, but you're going to remember because you're young enough to, to still be able to maintain three things at once, not just two. Uh, you may be overestimating me. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. Talk, talk about the fact also that a lot of this ideology on the left is playing directly 
into the hands of the paranoid right to the extent that it's almost like a cartoon. You know, here's our head on a platter again. Um, you know, here we are, here we go again. Um, you know, talking as if we're a page out of Orwell. Um, talk a little bit about the way this plays into that. And if you don't want it to be Donald Trump and these horrible strong men all the way down, then stop handing your head on a platter to them, becoming a caricature of their worst iteration of what they say the left is, that it up till now has not been. But now it's beginning to fulfill their worst prophecies, their worst dreams, it seems to me. Yeah, let's start with free speech, which is a topic that's very important to me. And as you're pointing out, it's a strange thing to have conceded to the right as much of a left in the United States has right. over the past 10 years. Um, I mentioned, I think, that Frederick Douglass called free speech the dread of tyrants. Yes. Because he recognized that it's what uh, allows the weakest in society to, yeah. to, to, to speak up. That's the thought that student activists had in the 1960s when they saw themselves as outsiders railing against the establishment. But one of the strange things that's happened over the last decades is that much of the left now sees itself, even if it doesn't always admit this to itself, as the establishment. And when you're the yeah. establishment, it's always tempting to try and... Well, and it has close. become in the, in the sense that you point out in the book where these ideologies have become corporatized, right. whether it's the Coca-Cola company or whatever. So it really is the establishment, not to mention our knowledge class, you know, this little detail here that plays into what you're saying. In the old days, newspaper like the New York Times had a mixture of backgrounds, and now it's all Ivy Leaguers who think one right. way. Right. And you see it. In the pages, it isn't just that they're a liberal institution. There's a sameness and a lack of imagination it, in the Times these days when I read it. It's changed. There, there's nothing edgy ever. It's very safe. They have a few token conservative voices, but everything is very much towing a certain type of line. Uh, you know, they don't seem to be of the left anymore. There's something else. Hard to name what that is. But I, I search yeah. in vain for, for, you know, a leftist through line of what I used to think the left would be right, about. Right. Freedom, free speech, tolerance, embracing the other. We're all moving along together. The arc of, you know, moving toward justice. This idea of parsing us all into racial, ethnic and sexual orientation groups is just so foreign to me. And, uh, and you know, one, of the, one of the things that I thought about in that context, because you're really interested in culture, you know, it's not something I say explicitly in the book, but I think it's really interesting where, you know, look at what the background culture was at a moment like 2008 when Barack Obama was elected. Right. Barack Obama was an imperfect president. It's impossible to change the country as much as uh, we might hope a president would. Yeah. But he is, in my lights, one of the most impressive, perhaps the most impressive politicians we've had in, in my lifetime, certainly Absolutely. my presence in the United States. What was the background culture that allowed him to get elected? Um, well, let's take a little tour d'horizon. Um, on Broadway, one of the biggest show was, shows was Book of Mormon. Right. On TV, it was the years in which South Park, Family Guy, 30 Rock were some of the big uh, comedies, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the most popular comedians was Louis C.K. Um, you know, you look at that background set of cultural conditions, and these are all people who have liberal values, with progressive values who stand mm -hmm. for a more tolerant world, but they're also all people who are a little bit edgy, who are self-ironic, who right. are willing to make fun of themselves, who don't feel themselves to be too superior to everybody else. And I think yeah. that created the background condition for somebody like Obama to be able to win. That's part of yes. what made people trust that moment. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at what uh, uh, sort of culturally is being pumped out today, it is so much more morally, it is so much more earnest, it is so much less willing to make fun of itself. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of Americans are drifting to, to the right. In a, in and, a just to, and just to mention something, eventually this group of people are going to start losing young people who in the end are going to become allergic to this group think. And they are creating the converts that are going to go to the hard right. And, and this goes to the third question you had. We're skipping around a little bit, but, um, you know, uh, one of the things that allowed these ideas to take hold so strongly in the progressive left was the fact that Donald Trump won in 2016. And right. People were understandably and rightly and genuinely scared about what a president might do. Well, and you've um, written and very, very well on Trump, by the way, for people who don't know your work. You know, you're right there and you've, you've made a terrific analysis of it from the left. 
Yeah, I like to say that I'm a democracy crisis hipster. I worried about the crisis of democracy before it was yeah. cool. I remain very worried about what's going to happen in 2024 if Donald Trump Me too. comes back to the White House, which looks entirely possible and plausible yep. if you're looking yep. at current polls, something I'm very concerned about. So, um, uh, uh, you know, so, 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 so one of the things that allowed these ideas to flourish on the left was Trump's election and the fact that uh, that made it very hard to criticize bad ideas on the left. It made you look at, you know, it made people look at you like a traitor if you were criticizing, mm. uh, uh, you know, certain social movements or, or certain ideas on the left. But conversely, the hold that these ideas now have over our culture more broadly and over our institutions, over our universities and think tanks, is part of what makes it more likely that Donald Trump is going to win election in 2024. Absolutely. More Americans right now, I don't agree with them, but more Americans right now think that the Democratic Party is too extreme than yeah. think that the Republican Party is too extreme. There was an yeah. analysis in the New York Times recently which showed that there's a new kind of tribe of people uh, voting for the Republican Party, about 10% of its electorate at the moment, who mm -hmm. are people who are predominantly young, predominantly non-white, predominantly liberal, progressive on lots well, of social and a, and a huge but, Hispanic group of people, 30% now plus are going to, for the Republicans. So that's that's in spite of Trump's naked racism. Right. And, and a lot of that is because they are really worried about the whole of these ideas over mainstream institutions and yeah. they don't trust the left anymore. So, so even though these two ideologies sort of seem to be in opposition to each other, practically mm -hmm. and politically, I like to say that we yin to, to each other's yang. They actually support each other. So to fight effectively against one, you have to fight against both. But perhaps- yeah, and, and, and a, new, a new kind of race, gender, sexual orientation basis of orthodoxy is not what anybody is looking for who wants to live in a better place. We want the brotherhood of humankind. We want connection. This is an era of loneliness. And to further isolate people into racial sexual orientation groups, et cetera, et cetera, is exactly not what we need. It's the sort of backward thinking of the, you know, that social media was going to connect us all. It didn't. It separated everybody. And now we have this ideology that is supposedly going to advance all sorts of things and actually by carving us into these little groups. And that's where I mentioned this book of mine, uh, Crazy for God. This is not a plug. It's a genuine connection. I talk about my journey away from a fundamentalist idea where our family was so pure that our church kept splitting because only we remained. And I joked at one point saying it boiled down to me and my sisters and my mom and dad. And I wasn't sure about my sister, Susan. I mean, it was so exclusive. I've mm -hmm. been there. I've seen this. It's the same problem that plagues certain Orthodox groups within Judaism. And it's a kind of a doctrinaire, blood in your eye, fist forward, humorless uh, thing. And I, I've been there, done that. I left this. I moved to the left. And now I feel like the left is being stolen from me by a group of right wing people masquerading as liberals. You know, one question that's interesting, isn't it, is that, you know, I believe in something like human nature. Right. Uh, we all have certain instincts, uh, uh, you know, and then our goal is to channel them in productive directions. But one of the key instincts we have is to favor the in-group over the out-group. Yes. Right? Like once you've defined the in-group in a particular way, and that's very flexible, that uh, is very malleable, depends from one historical context to another. But once you've said, this is my in-group, you have a strong instinct to favor the in-group over the out-group, to treat the people who are part of us with right. sometimes great courage and altruism, but to treat the people who are them uh, with disregard and sometimes rank cruelty and violence. Hmm. And one of the big things that social norms and ideals need to do is to both encourage us to lean into more socially productive identities and to check ourselves, to not give us a reason, an ideology that uh, encourages us to have this deep disregard for other groups. And I think we're failing on both of those things. We're failing with many elite private schools in this country at this point um, have racial affinity groups in the third grade, in the second grade, in the first grade, where teachers yeah. come in and tell kids to split up into different groups go off to their corners well it's a um, resegregation absolutely and and to you know they, they want they say that the purpose of a progressive left wing a progressive education is to make children think of themselves as racial beings i mean how much more in contrast to a traditional left 
can you stand? But it's yeah, also Martin Luther King spinning in, in his grave. Yes, and it's also what you then encourage in terms of uh, how you act once you've once you conceive of yourself as part of one group. Um, and when the ideology of the supposed left basically encourages the most rank form of in-group bias of the most you know naked forms of Afro-nationalism just at the level of subnational identity groups based around things like race. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've reinvented right-wing ideology. Well, it um, is. It's the language of Donald thin, Trump. Progressive tint. Yeah. It's the language of Donald Trump. We're going to ban Muslim immigration. We're going to stop all these Mexicans coming in because they're all rapists. And he puts it in a crude, non-academic way. I want to jump in because I know you, you know, we're going to run out of time at some point. And this is in your book, you explain Foucault and everybody else, and you go through the whole history of this. And I don't want to repeat that here. But how do you, in broad strokes, without going too deep into the people who are involved in terms of academics in Paris, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how do we explain this rapid transition in the American academic community from uh, the left that we understood to be liberal and outgoing about, about what has been called, and I think very aptly, the survival of the friendliest, that its connection and cooperation is the only reason that evolution has kept us going? It's the exact opposite of all this. Um, how do we explain the movement from what is called liberal now to this kind of right-wing philosophical idea of division where we're telling kids in the second and third grade to break away into these little groups racially, sexually, and all the rest? Uh, you know, you're growing up in this idea that you're isolated. These people don't understand you because they have a different color. They're a different orientation. Instead of a sort of a universalist principle, what the hell has gone wrong with the American academic scene that is also now influencing the UK that's in some ways gone even further than we have to the point where they are now legislating against free speech and calling more and more and more things hate speech that are getting more and more tangential to how we would assume that word would be used. What the hell has happened to the university community? You teach in a university. What's what's gone? What's happening? Well, what's happened is that uh, first of all, these bad ideas uh, were born on the university and have outsized sway in the university. Hmm. Uh, but second of all, that it has become incredibly hard to argue against these ideas in university communities. I mean, one of the things I was really struck by is that, um, you know, when I started researching this book, I thought, let me read the best intellectual history of where these ideas come from. And there are no academics, no serious academics who have actually offered that intellectual history. And the reason for that is that if you want to do it in a serious way, but might also uh, contain elements that are critical, you're going to get potentially into trouble and people don't seem to have wanted to do that, right? In other words, you're not even, you don't even feel free to talk about this. So why bother? Because you're going to be shut down and dismissed. Yeah. I mean, one of the experiences I've had repeatedly in the last years, and I'm I wonder what you have, and perhaps many of your listeners have had too, is that you have lunch with somebody and they say the sort of things you've been saying in this conversation. And then they add as a matter of, of course, but of course I would never say this publicly. Oh no, I hear this um, all the time. And the funny thing is the New York Times who who wanted to disrespect your book from that kind of liberal right-wing fascistic point of view dismissed that and that, that very thing in your book saying, you know, he says that he's met people like this and of course, you know, questioning. And the funny thing is, for instance, I know somebody who's one of the founders of moveon.org that was one of the first online leftist sites. She tells me this all the time. Here's how I'm really feeling, but I can't say that. And I know someone who was one of the founders of, uh, uh, you know, who actually ran Planned Parenthood for 18 years. She told me the same thing. You have all these people who have been in movements for ages uh, and, and, um, you know, there's a kind of, and that's a very bad sign, by the way, uh, when, when people can't say what they really think or feel they can't anyway. So sorry to have interrupted you. Keep going on. No, the no. Community. Uh, that's, that's, that's right. So, you know, I mean, so that speaks to, uh, this question you had earlier about, uh, you know, what's going on and, 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 and how to respond to this. Right. Um, and I think uh, we're in this strange moment of self-enforced silence, but mm-hmm. perhaps some of these recent events are pushing people out of it. Um, I do think that 
the lopsided response of some student groups, but also of many institutions, right? The fact that universities so for the last five years had gotten into the habit of making collective statements about all kinds of things going on in the world, but right. when Hamas terrorists murdered over 1,400 civilians, they took days to say anything and only did so because some very prominent alumni, or in the case of Harvard, the former president of the university, yeah. ended up calling out their silence. Um, uh, you know, so I think that that creates a moment when people can start to understand the danger of these ideas and push back against them. And even mm -hmm. at universities, most people aren't deep ideologues in these ideas. It's just that they have felt that it's easier to uh, go along to get along. But if you're the one speaking out about this, then you're going to get the brunt of the anger of those activists that want to enforce those views. And I hope that this might be a moment when people start to push back against that. Well, when you describe that phenomena in the universities, the academic community where ideas and free speech are supposed to be paramount, it reminds me of talking about the House Republicans, where you have this small majority of loud, crazy, off the wall, right wing Republican people who, uh, you know, the majority feel threatened by enough to, to not stand up to. And and you know why again why why how can the mirror image in the academic community look more like the House Republicans than they do to what I always consider to be liberals, free speech uh, of the left, open to all ideas. Let's hear your opinion. What's you know it just seems it's mind boggling to me that in a ten to fifteen year period that seems to have been threatened. Well, and, and, and here, uh, well, there's, there's a few reasons for that. One is, as I was saying, that the left suddenly feels like they're in charge and that, that, that a lot of these conversations about free speech started in places where the left assumed that it was going to be in control. When you're having these conversations at Harvard University or at Smith College, it is plausible to think that the speech code that you're imposing is going to punish uh, uh, you know, bad views on the right and ensconce, you know, lovely uh, progressive views that serve the great and the good, right? Um, uh, uh, I, I oppose them in any context, but one of the problems with this is that it just fundamentally misunderstands how free speech works, which is that the kinds of committees in the federal government that might decide what is allowed to be said and what is not allowed to be said if we actually undermine the First Amendment in ways that many European countries now have genuine restrictions on free speech where you'll end in prison if you say something that's considered offensive. The, yeah. the members of that group are not going to be uh, you know, professors of gender studies. Right. right. They're going to be people who often will have deeply conservative views. And it's very ironic for the left to claim that America is in its essence racist or white supremacist and then say, let's leave institutions in America to decide what can be said. Right. Mm -hmm. For structural reasons, the kinds of people who make decisions, whether it's in federal government or in some Silicon Valley company speech facilitation committee or whatever it might be called, the kinds of people who make decisions about what you can say and what you can't say are always going to be relatively affluent, relatively powerful, relatively sure, exactly. dominant. That's that's why they're members of those committees. And so I think that's just a fundamental mistake that many members of the left have made about how free speech works. And it can only make that mistake because there is this unspoken belief that actually the establishment and the decision makers are now us. Uh, yeah, and the thing, the thing is- belief for the left to hold. There's a kind of a parallel to the greenwashing of oil companies talking about how they're working on the environment while pumping more oil all the time. This kind of virtue signal signaling, uh, you know, so so they open a meeting with recognizing that the property they're sitting on once belonged to thus and so Native American tribe. But you'll notice Coca-Cola or whomever the facilitators working for is not advocating that the corporation then knocks their building down and finds the remnant of that uh, no, you know, North American, Native American group and gives the land back, the, its pronouncement without action. Um, there's a falseness to this. Um, the, the, it really strikes me. I, I want to go to a positive note as we get close to your heart out here, because you have another interview you're preparing for. You write in, in, in the book, it should be little surprise that some of the most celebrated epochs of human history have come at times and in places that allowed different cultures to inspire each other. From Baghdad of the ninth century to the Vienna of the 19th century to London and New York in the 21st century, it was cultural 
hybridity that allowed multi-ethnic societies to thrive and shine. For all these reasons, the joy of mutual influence is not a sin against which diverse societies should be on guard. It is the key promise they hold out to us if we get things right. Instead of condemning cultural appropriation, we should seek to build a society in which members of every group are valued equally and all are free to draw inspiration from the cultures of their compatriots. And I think that's such a good summation of um, you know, what your book stands for and what it's about. So do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, this goes back to what we're talking a little bit uh, about when we talk about cultural appropriation, but it also goes to an even more fundamental question, which yeah. is the idea that if you stand at a different intersection of identities, to me, we can't understand each other. And so the way to build political solidarity is for me to de defer to whatever you demand. I yeah. think that that is uh, both an unrealistic and an unappealing vision of what political solidarity consists in. Mm. Right. It's true that our experience of a world is mediated in various ways by the groups of which we are part. I don't naturally know what it feels like to be a woman who's afraid of being sexually harassed in the subway, for example. But uh, I believe in the ability of human communication. I believe in the ability of Japanese audiences to be moved by the fiddler on the roof. I believe in my ability to read a novel um, and empathize with it. So I yeah. was not the child of... Uh, preachers, I believe in my ability to pick up your book and and empathize with uh, what your childhood experience was mm -hmm. was like. And that, I think, is a much more appealing model for political solidarity, right? When yeah. my fellow citizens uh, or when people outside the country experience injustice, um, I want to stand in solidarity with them, not because I say, I don't understand you, so I guess I should just go along with what you demand. No, because I've taken the time and effort to understand a little bit of your experience and to recognize that it's unfair, that it's unjust, that it violates my own ideas for how mm. to live in a better society, for the kind of country and the kind of world that I want to build. And so I think that we need to hold on to that more ambitious political tradition, the one that's rooted in the best of a gay rights movement, which allowed us to fight for things like same-sex marriage when that one seemed really unlikely. The one that allowed us not to create a world where uh, we don't have racial injustices, but where we treat each other much more openly and fairly than we did 100 or 50 or 30 years ago. Um, and I think to do that, we have to return to an older form of left-wing values, um, uh, double down on the ideal of living up to our universalist values rather than dismissing them. The uh, the book, and please buy it and read it, um, is The Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time. Uh, we will link to the book. We will link to you. You will give Ernie, our producer, whatever links you want to provide to have people be able to find your material, which is so valuable. I hope you come back. I would like to interview you again, maybe talk with my friend John Ward, who's the one of the editors at Yahoo News, who writes um, about a, a lot of interesting things. The three of us would have a good discussion. That would be a good one to do again on your book and, and on his book. Uh, and I just want to end with one thing. You were talking about Jeannie and me having been together 53 years, and it really does tie into your work. Um, you know, we met as teenagers. We were completely different people. I don't remember who those kids were. Why are we still married? Uh, because neither of us see the barrier of gender or age as standing between us. We are mm. best friends. We are best friends as humans first and as sexual beings second. That's why we're still married. That's why our marriage works. And by the way, that's why we enjoy our sexuality too, because we both bring something totally different to the bed that we share together. And it's not a demand that the other person become us, but at the same time, there's a mutuality there, which is why I get up in the morning and clean the kitchen. And Jeannie does our taxes because I hate paperwork. And she got sick of doing any housekeeping. And that's what made it work. And if that works for two people and keeps a marriage together, surely everything is a village. Everything is community. It is the survival of the friendliest. 
And the survival of the friendliest depends on accentuating the things that binds us, not the things that separates us. So Jeannie never says to me, well, you won't understand that you're not a woman. I don't say to her, this is a man's point of view. It's how do we find a commonality here to keep that friendship alive in spite of everything? And it isn't, you know, emphasizing the differences is not what makes 53 years turn into the best friendship anyone can imagine. It's exactly what you're advocating in your book in a very personal realm. So uh, that's an odd note to end on, but please read. Well, let me let me let me say book. one very brief thing, which is that you know one of the most beautiful arguments uh, about this is made by John Stuart Mill, one of the great yes. liberal philosophers. Yeah, and in the subjection of women, he makes an interesting argument. He argues that the you know extreme subjection of women at the time in the United Kingdom was unjust to women for any number of reasons. But he said that it was also bad for men. Yes, of course. Because if by virtue of marriage you acquire rights over your wife, as in the case, as the time was true in the United Kingdom, yeah. then you can never have a relationship of true equality with mm -hmm. your partner. And that is something that men miss out on as well as women. Absolutely. I think that preserves an ideal of how to achieve social equality yeah. that inspires a lot of my work on these other subjects as well. So thank you for sharing this, these beautiful sentiments about your marriage and congratulations. Well, hey, you know, um, you can congratulate Jeannie because she's <laughs> she's the one who has guided us there. But the mutuality is what makes things work, not the emphasis of difference. I loved your book, The Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time. Yasha Monk, um, I think it's a terrific book. And I hope people read it and it continues the discussion. And maybe at this pivotal moment in, in world history, because God knows between what's going on in the Middle East and also with Russia attacking Ukraine, we're having enough of the authoritarian and the terror and the rest of it. If we can't find a way to do better, we're all in deep, deep shit. And by further dividing us into racial and ethnic groups um, and sexual orientation and the rest is the last thing anybody needs. So thank you for writing the book. We'll talk again. Thank you, Frank, I for having me on. I really enjoyed this. Real pleasure. Thanks.